Well, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you all are having a good Sabbath. I've got a question for you, a little bit of a pop quiz. So don't open your Bible or close your app on your phone, whichever one you use. Don't, don't look just yet. We'll look in just a minute. But a little bit of a pop quiz. According to the account in Genesis, what are the first words that God spoke? According to what's recorded there for us in Genesis, what are the, what are the first words that we see God speak? Now, it's more, than, it's more than just a trivia question, because these first words, they become a thread that God uses throughout the Bible to help better explain his way. So let's turn over to Genesis now, and let's read the first five verses to begin with, and we'll start to answer this question. We'll start in Genesis chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse 1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. So that's the first thing that we're told here in Genesis about the creation. We're introduced to God and that God created the heavens and the earth. That word God is Strong's H4030. It's Elohim, and it's the plural form of God, and it's the word that's refer, used to refer to the supreme God. We're told that he made the heavens and the earth. And Moses is recording this account for us. And he came from a world world that believed in many different types of gods. Some cultures had many gods that each had different responsibilities. But here we're told that there's one Godhead who created everything that we see in heaven and in earth. All right, well, let's keep going because we hadn't quite answered our question just yet. So let's keep going. Verse 2. Verse 2 says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So here the English kind of gives a picture that the world was maybe created in a state of chaos. But you know, God's not the author of confusion. The phrase without form is translated from Strong's H8414, Tohu, And one of its definitions is confusion. In fact, we're actually told later in the book of Job that the angels rejoiced when God laid the foundations of the earth. So that doesn't exactly line up with it being created in this state of confusion. So when we look at the word that was translated was in verse 2, we find that the Hebrew word would probably more accurately be translated became. So here we find the heavens and the earth, they were created in the beginning. And then the earth becomes without form and void. This darkness and the voidness on the earth was caused by something. And I think if we put the pieces together throughout the Bible, what we can see is that after the rebellion of Satan, this confusion was caused. Jesus Christ would later tell his disciples that he saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. And I believe that this verse indicates that when he hit the earth, incredible damage was done. See, God created everything perfect. We're told that even Lucifer was created perfect, but but iniquity was found in him when he got pride, and his pride caused him to sin. Lucifer was created beautiful and perfect, And I believe that this world was as well. And then verse 3 starts to take us into day one of this recreation. And here we'll start to get the answer to the question I asked. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. So evening and the morning were the first day. So there we find the answer to the question I asked, right? The first thing that's recorded for us that God spoke here in the book of Genesis is let there be light. God made a very visible difference between his way of life 
and the way of sin and death. He gave us a very powerful analogy that he uses throughout Scripture to teach us more about his plan and his purpose. And there's a thread that runs from creation through revelation that contrasts light and darkness. And that thread runs through physical Israel, the tabernacle, the priests, through Jesus Christ, and the tabernacle, the spiritual body that he's building today. But here in Genesis, we're told that before God does anything else, God creates light and he separates it from the darkness. This is before that there was any stars or moon or sun, anything like that. See, those don't come till day four. We kind of think of those things as the things that bring light these days, right? But before any of those things existed, God created the light. He created it independent of those celestial bodies that give us light today. It's interesting that this passage is very specific about God creating the light. See, the passage says in verse 3, then God said, let there be light. The passage doesn't say that God said, let there be light and dark. Just let there be light. In fact, verse 2 tells us that the darkness already existed, right? See, the world had been created perfect. There was no sin, and without sin, there wasn't any darkness. But God didn't introduce the darkness. Satan did. Satan introduced sin, and with sin came the darkness. And light and dark, they've got a physical separation, don't they? Light and dark can't coexist in the same space. Darkness only exists where there is an absence of light. So in, in the physical sense, we can maybe carry a flashlight with us, right? We can carry a candle. We can actually hold something that produces light. But you really can't carry or hold something that produces darkness. Darkness just exists where there is no light. Or maybe the light is being blocked by something that's creating a shadow. So let's, let's fast forward a little bit to the time of ancient Israel. So let's jump forward to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. And we'll read verses 19 and 20. So God had led the people out of Egypt... And he did that by a pillar of fire at night and cloud during the day. And here we find God making another separation between dark and light. So Exodus chapter 14, we'll read verses 19 and 20. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. So he was leading them and now he moves to the back. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. So God's making a separation here between Israel and Egypt. God told Pharaoh that Israel was his firstborn. So here, God's separating his children from the Egyptians. God's separating those who are his from those who are not his. And that separation was evident from all to see, for all to see. The Egyptians couldn't make their way to the Israelites. And there was light for the children of Israel. But the Egyptians had darkness on them. So why does God do this? Well, the Israelites, they had just got done observing Passover. And the blood of the lamb on their doorposts and the lintel, it caused that death angel to pass over them. And the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and the lintel, it saved their lives from that death angel. See, God was delivering the Israelites from death. He was bringing them from the darkness of Egypt, from the darkness of slavery, from the darkness of sin, from the darkness of false worship, 
and he was delivering them into the light of truth. He was delivering them into freedom. He was delivering them into true worship. But the Egyptians, they were left in the dark. See, they pictured the sin that this world entangles itself in. And they pictured the death that sin produces. See, light and darkness were separated as much as life and death are separate. Now, God knew where the Israelites were going, right? But the Israelites didn't necessarily know where they were headed. He told them that they were going to go into the wilderness and worship him, but they didn't know exactly where. And we're told here there was already dark, and they're up against the Red Sea. They weren't quite sure where to go, and God tells them to move forward. And to help them do that, he gave them a guiding light so they could see where they were going. See, light provides illumination so that we can see where we're walking. God provided them a directional light so they could see where they were going and how to get there. Kind of like using a flashlight at night to take a walk outside, maybe. You need illumination to see where you're going, and the light provides that. The Israelites, they make it to Mount Sinai, and God gives Moses instructions for building a tabernacle to worship him. And if we go to the instructions for the tabernacle, we'll see kind of a continuation of this concept. So let's turn forward a few pages to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 37. Because here we find some instructions for building a golden lampstand that was to be in the tabernacle and providing light to the Israelites. So Exodus chapter 25, in verse 37, it says, You shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it. So the gold lampstand was to be built so that the light would be directed towards the front. The light was directional. It was pointing away forward. Or perhaps even maybe like a spotlight to highlight something important or to provide a little extra light for working. See, the Israelites, they had a lot of work to do to come out of Egypt that required light. You know, physically speaking, they left Egypt at night with well over two million people. And Exodus tells us that God brought them through the wilderness. And, you know, there's no street lights back there. No street lights back then in the wilderness. And it gets real dark, doesn't it? Imagine being out there in the middle of the woods somewhere at night with no flashlight or even in the middle of the desert. And you probably wouldn't make it very far without stumbling or tripping onto something. And then they had to cross the Red Sea at night. And Pharaoh was trying his best to get at him. But God illuminated their path with a pillar of fire that they could follow as a beacon in the night so that they would know which way to go. Now, spiritually speaking, they needed a light to point them in the right direction toward God. And God would spend the next 40 years working with them and teaching them. And the tabernacle was where God would, would meet with them. And it used physical things to point forward to a spiritual fulfillment later. Let's turn forward a little bit more to Leviticus, chapter 24. Leviticus, chapter 24. We'll read verses 1 through 4. And we can find a few more details about the lampstands that they used in the tabernacle. Leviticus, chapter 24, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually. Outside the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting, Aaron shall be in charge of it from evening until morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statue forever in your generations." He shall, be, he shall be in charge of the lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. So there's four key details in these four verses. We'll talk a little bit more about. 
So first, Aaron the high priest, he was responsible to keep that light maintained before God. Second, the lamp is to be maintained continually. Third, the lampstand is located in the tabernacle on the outside of the veil where it could be visible to all who would come in the tabernacle. And fourth, we find that the fuel that's to be used in the lampstands is pure olive oil. And Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown says that this would have been cold-pressed olive oil that would have burned very, very clean. So those might not seem like important details, but God is using the physical symbols here of the tabernacle to kind of point us forward to the spiritual. So let's start with Aaron the priest. So it was his responsibility to keep that lamp burning and maintain that light. Now Aaron, he was a physical high priest, but he pointed forward to Jesus Christ, our high priest. Let's go over to John chapter 1. John, the first chapter, chapter 1, we'll read verses 1 through 9, and we'll see a little bit more about how Jesus Christ was going to be this light. John chapter 1, we'll, we'll start in verse 1 here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So here we find a little bit more information about that Godhead that we read about in Genesis. We got two beings together at the beginning. One identified as the Word, one identified as God, and we're told that both are God. Continuing on in verse 3, it said, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. So Jesus Christ, the one who created light, he came into this world in order to shine in the darkness of sin and death and to be a beacon that leads all mankind to life. His own creation didn't understand who he was or what he was doing here at the time. He came to save this world from sin and they wanted to kill him. Aaron tending the lamp in the tabernacle, keeping that light burning, pointed forward to the time in which Jesus would come into the world and shine forth light into this world shine forth light into that darkness Jesus came and he was a beacon that people could follow to God and Jesus illuminated the path to eternal life not only for Israel but for the whole world let's turn a couple pages forward to John chapter 8 and verse 12 John chapter 8 in verse 12, because here Christ makes it even more explicit what his, message, what his uh, mission was. John 8, in verse 12, it says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Christ came so that the world wouldn't have to walk in darkness. God didn't want the Israelites to have to walk in darkness on their way out of Egypt. And the Israelites didn't know where they were going. God knew where they were going and how to get them there. But he wanted them to follow him. It wouldn't have gotten the desired result if God just kind of teleported them into the promised land. God needed them to follow him so that he could know their heart. So he led them by, at night by a pillar of fire which gave them light and pointed them in the direction that they needed to go. Just as he led those ancient Israelites out of Egypt so many years before, Jesus had now come to earth in the flesh to lead humanity out of darkness. And what is that darkness? Well, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but Egypt was kind of a pagan society that, that didn't worship God, right? 
And after the death of the firstborns on Passover, the Israelites came out of Egypt on that first day of unleavened bread. See, Egypt pictured that death that sin leads to, and God led them out of it. He saved them from that death. And Jesus Christ came to be that Passover and to pay that death penalty for us. But before he paid the price of our salvation, he lived a perfect life, and he set an example for us to follow. He set up a beacon of light that shows us which way to go. His life, the example that he lived for us, is the light that shows us which way to go. His death and his resurrection makes eternal life possible for us. So the second detail about the gold lamp stand was that the light was supposed to be maintained continually. That's something that's impossible for a human being to do. Because even if you could put enough oil in it so that you only had to add oil once a day to maintain that light, eventually human beings die. Aaron eventually died and he was replaced. But Jesus Christ, however, he was resurrected and he's got eternal life. He's got life within himself. He's our eternal high priest. He can be that light always. And his perfect light is an eternal beacon of light that points the way to God. He's at the right hand of God forever, and if we follow him, we will find God. But Jesus Christ, he was only in this world for a short time, right? Let's turn over probably one page or so to John chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. John chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. He says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming in which no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So he's the light of this world as long as he's in the world, right? But he's no longer living here as a human being. That part of God's plan is complete. He came, he lived a perfect life. He came and he illuminated truth. He came to be a beacon for us to follow. He came and he revealed the Father. He came and he became our Passover. He finished all of those missions, right? And when he returns to earth, he's going to be returning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But he didn't leave this world without light. In fact, he conferred that mission over to us. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we'll read verses 14 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. It says, You, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand that it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So Jesus Christ was the light of the world when he was here. And he pointed people to the Father. But he's conferred that responsibility to us now. If we follow him, then we're the lights of the world. It's our job to point people to the Father and to the Son with the ultimate goal of them gaining eternal life. But just because it's our job now, that doesn't mean that Jesus Christ isn't going to be helping us do it, because he is. In fact, this kind of takes us back to the third detail of the golden lampstand. Let's go back real quick to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. We'll pick up one verse here, verse 22. Daniel chapter 2, verse 22. It says, He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. So light dwells with God. So having the lights going all the time pictured God dwelling with Israel in the tabernacle, right? 
In 2 Corinthians 6, God, we're told that we are the temple of God. And John 14 tells us that God and Christ will come and make their abode with us. Okay? That lampstand, it was located inside the tabernacle. All right? The tabernacle, that was just a forerunner for the temple. Before there was a temple, there was a tabernacle. And that was where all the religious ceremonies took place. And it was where God tabernacled with men, where God dwelt with men. His presence would actually fill that tabernacle. It was God's dwelling place on earth. And to signify that God's presence was there, they kept that light going all the time. And what we just read here in Daniel tells us that light dwells with God. So when Christ says that we're the lights of the world, he can say that because he knows that it's him living in us. Right? Christ living in us puts the light into us. We're the light of the world because Christ is living in us. Or maybe you like to think of it as the moon. Maybe that's a better analogy. Right? The moon doesn't have any light of its own. But it reflects the light from the sun. That, that's kind of how we can work. We can reflect that light of Jesus Christ outward. And that brings us to the fourth detail from the golden lampstand. The fuel for the light is olive oil. Now we do anointings then and now with olive oil because that oil pictures God's Holy Spirit. And to make light from this style of lamp, you've got to burn the oil. That's how this style of lamp works. Now there's three ingredients needed to make a fire. We've got a fireman sitting back there. You might have seen it as the fire triangle, right? So those three ingredients are oxygen, an ignition source, and fuel. The ancient Israelites would have had to constantly press those olives to get oil to keep burning, keep that fire burning, and to keep that light shining. But God's Holy Spirit comes from an eternal spring that never runs dry. All we have to do is practice using it. God's Holy Spirit can provide the fuel, but we've got to provide the oxygen, and we've got to provide the ignition source. It does no good to have the Holy Spirit if we don't use it. See, Christ lives in us through the Holy Spirit, but if we neglect or if we quench that Holy Spirit, then our light can go out. You know, that's kind of what happened in the story of the ten virgins, right? They didn't pay attention, or at least half of them didn't, to the oil that was in their lamps. They neglected that gift of the Holy Spirit. And instead of having plenty of oil, their lights were almost out when the bridegroom came. They didn't have enough light to illuminate the path to the wedding. And we're exhorted to stir up the Holy Spirit. So we need to have zeal for God and for his way of life if we're to keep enough energy to keep that fire going. If we become complacent, if we lack zeal and enthusiasm, if we don't put energy toward God, the fire and the light will go out. We have to keep that fire stoked if we're going to let our light shine. And this world is in desperate need of light, right? This world is saturated with darkness. It desperately needs our light to shine forward. You know, God does the calling, but it's our duty to put work in and to be his lights in the dark and dying world. It's our job to point the way toward life by living an example that reflects how Christ lived. As Christ lives in us and as we strive to be obedient, repentant, and humble with zeal for him and his work, he will live in us and shine forth into this world of darkness. So how do we go about doing that? Well, I mentioned at the beginning that light is used in an analogy throughout the Bible, so let's turn over to Psalm 43 and look at one of those analogies. Psalm 43, Psalm 43 and verse 3, it says, O send out your light and your truth, let them lead me, let them bring me to your holy hill 
and to your tabernacle. So here light is compared to truth. The truth of God can be used like light to lead us. God's holy hill or his tabernacle is a metaphor for where God's living. In other words, truth can be used like a beacon or a lighthouse to get us to God. And this is how God works with each of us, right? He reveals his truth to us, and he uses that to draw us. God uses truth to lead us, but he doesn't force us. We've got to be willing to follow where the light of God's truth is leading us. You know, a hill is a fixed location, right? The hill doesn't move. And here the psalmist is desiring to find God, so he asks God to send out a light of truth so that he can move in the right direction toward God. If we don't follow God's truth, we might end up further lost in the dark or moving in the opposite direction of God. It's a little bit like those old Motel 6 commercials, right? We'll leave the light on for you. That way you'll know where it is by the roadside. You know where to stop. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. In verse 27. Because now that we know that we should be pointing the what, the what we should be pointing the world to, we need to know how we should approach our mission of being lights in the world. So Matthew chapter 10, verse 27 and 28 gives us a little bit more information on this. It says, "Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops." And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So we got another analogy for light and dark here, don't we? Light being akin to being in public, to being out there, right? And darkness being akin to being in secret. The, the calling that we have is a special calling, isn't it? He's, God has given us knowledge that he's not given to everyone. But he doesn't expect it, us to keep it to ourselves. He expects us to proclaim it in public. He expects us to live it every day. He expects us to be a Christian everywhere, not just in our homes in private. We should stand out in this world. We should be thought of as different. But beyond living and preaching what God has given us in public with those that we know, we're told to shout it from the rooftops, right? We're to try to reach as many people as we can. And this is despite the persecution that is sure to come from doing so. We must always fear God more than we fear man. We must always obey God over man. You know, there's a, a time coming where our allegiance to the way of God will cause serious persecutions. Are we preparing for that now? You know, we won't, we won't be allowed to be Switzerland. They're not going to let us be neutral. They're going to make us pick a side. And so we're God. God's going to make us pick a side as well. We're not called to compromise with this world and its ways. I mentioned 2 Corinthians 6 earlier. Let's, let's actually go there. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll read verses 14 through 18. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Starting in verse 14. It says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. And walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. 
I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You know, back in Genesis, God made a separation between light and darkness, and he expects us to keep that separation. In fact, if we're truly being lights, that separation is going to be pretty clear, right? The darkness is the poles of the sin in our carnal nature. We're supposed to be putting that stuff to death. The light is the fruit of the Spirit that's produced in a converted mind that's bringing every thought into captivity. It's not easy, but it's what we're called to do. And that separation will become evident even if we don't want it to be. You know, there'll be activities that we miss because of the Sabbath. Perhaps there'll be jobs or promotions that you won't get because of the Sabbath. You know, the world's going to think that you should go to church on a weird day, right? You're going to have to tell them over and over again, it's one 24-hour period from Friday night at sundown to Saturday at sundown, right? And even our food's going to be different, right? We ask if there's bacon on that salad because we don't want it, right? Everybody else asks if there's bacon on the salad because they do want it, but we don't want it, right? We're trying to make sure it's not there. There's going to be a separation between us and the world, and if we're doing it right, it's going to be variable noti- very noticeable to those who are closest to us. You know, the people that we work with, the people that we see regularly in, in a friendship or maybe a community-type setting, our neighbors, they're going to see it. And they should notice the difference. And they may ask questions. See, our responsibilities to shine our light is is coupled with a requirement to give a warning. Let's go to Acts chapter 9 and verse 3. Acts chapter 9 and verse 3. And we'll see an example of this. Because God had to get Saul's attention. And he did it with a light. But he also did it with a message. Acts chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. And it says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So God's light shines so brightly that Saul was stopped in his tracks. He couldn't move. He fell to the ground. But kind of like a firework that's got a light, but it's also got a sound with it. The light wasn't the only thing that got Saul's attention. God spoke to Saul, and he gave him a message. It was a message of repentance. Why are you kicking against me, Saul? God has called us to be lights in this world through Jesus Christ living in us. And he called us to live as he lived and to preach a message of repentance to this world. We should shine forth into the darkness so brightly that we cannot be hidden. And we should do it no matter the potential repercussions. We can't make everyone else heed the warning that we're going to be giving. We can't make anyone else walk the path that we are illuminating. But it's our duty to God to follow the path ourselves and to heed the warning ourselves and to illuminate the path and point the way forward and to shout from the housetops, this is the way, walk in it. 